Hi, it's JP Rodriguez and Ryan Tibbetts again, and we're here talking about uh, meniscus surgery. This is podcast number two. And number two. Not just surgery, it's uh, meniscus tears in general, mm-hmm. the different types, how they happen, and what we do to manage them. Yeah, meniscus tear is probably one of the more common injuries I would say I see in sports medicine practice. Um, probably one of the more common surgeries that I do with regards to especially arthroscopy for knees especially. Yeah. Um, the gamut from the young athlete even to the older degenerative meniscus tear um, you know no one is immune to not getting a meniscus tear Um, kind of typical presentation for you what do you when you see that in a younger athlete what's that kind of mechanism how do they present yeah for me in the younger athletes it's usually like a pretty high energy thing Mm -hmm. Um, there are some rare exceptions and we can kind of talk about those on some low energy stuff that's still pretty traumatic but for the most part it's cutting sports in the soccer or, or and some of the kids I've had they'll tear them and not not know that they've done that big of an injury because they've never been hurt before right. um, but uh, usually characterized when those acute ones lots of swelling no pain before and pretty notable disability and sometimes some clicking or catching or those mechanical symptoms that we're always right. focused on and some of those unique cases in the cases where the meniscus can actually tear the meniscus being the c-shaped cartilage on the inside and outside of the knee, you can get certain tear types that actually displace and can block motion. A bucket handle tear is one that's actually uh, specific where people can't even move their knee. So there's some different types. As you kind of move into more of your weekend warrior, Mm -hmm. middle-aged, if you will, um, kind of athlete, um, those are similar presentation, usually not as high energy, um, depending upon what the mechanism may be. Um, do you see a difference with regards to how they present or? Yeah, it's usually, like you said, it's not as high of an energy. And sometimes there's even a little bit preceding pain. Right. Like they're like, ah, my, nor- my knees were a little achy and then I did this and then I felt something. And like you said, low energy, like I just did a little twist or I got up or even it didn't hurt me that bad at the time. Mm-hmm. And the next day, I'm sure you hear that story. Yeah, and I always feel like I feel like with those patients, especially, there's always a twisting or rotational moment yeah. that they can usually recall. I think as you move into the little bit older population who are beginning to develop some arthritis, when they have more of a what we call a degenerative meniscus tear, they have like the really low energy, like you know, things that you'd be even questionable about. You know, they were leaning down to do something and stood up and they felt some pain or they were dece- or descending stairs and stepped and felt something. Right. Um, the thing is, is that they can go on to be fairly symptomatic um, and they, they do really well whenever it's an acute, you know, right. tear. Um, so what are your kind of, as you get into the degenerative tears, I know there's a lot of controversy with regards to arthritis, right? meniscus tears, when to treat. Um, talk a little bit about that with regards to how you approach it. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of the framework for me is that they're, it's really three different, like you said, it's three different entities. Right. You know, there's acute traumatic, you know, meniscus tears. And I see those in, um, like you said, those high school athletes when they tear their ACL, that kind of stuff, or even when they don't tear their ACL. And then, like we talked about, the second category being, uh, a degenerative tear, but there's no arthritis, right? So mm-hmm. somebody's meniscus has just become dehydrated, and maybe we're seeing the first presentation mm-hmm. of the, you know, molecular arthritis developing, and then that's where they get these less. And then the final one being like, okay, the the arthritis is set in the meniscus is a vulnerable structure in the setting of arthritis, right. and that we're here. So I try to make sure that explain to people and come at it from a different view. So when somebody comes in with arthritis and they have a meniscus tear, we're talking about arthritis. Right. And then we're explaining the meniscus tear like in relationship said, to as that. that's part of it. You know, you've got tears and, you know, bone pain and mm-hmm. inflammation and meniscus tears. And it's all just, these are the things that hurt in arthritis. Right, right. And, the, the, and then the younger group, it's an easier one too. Hey, you, you know, these are structures that are necessary for your knee mm-hmm. and they're hurt. And, um, if it's a stable injury, then it might be able to heal itself. If it's an unstable injury, then we can repair it. And that's a little bit of my, my thinking more recently has been that some of these stable meniscus tears, even in young people, I've, I've, I've had them heal. 
right. when they're isolated injuries. And talk about that. So that brings up a good point when you talked about kind of biology of the meniscus. I think one of the big things that people hear about with regards to meniscus tears is the blood supply. Yeah. And so a lot of patients, they hear, oh, I have a meniscus tear. You just need to repair it. Or, and so some of those, you know, speak to part of with regards to the vascular zones and yeah. how that's kind of portion of the meniscus is formed in utero and you can have some tears that don't have good blood supply. Right. And the chances of those in a younger patient healing, you know, if, if it are going to be less, whereas in maybe a degenerative tear, there's some variation, but blood supply is really the question. Right. Um, and like the meniscus structure, as we all, it was, we may have mentioned before has, you know, what I, I still subscribe to the three zone idea three zone, that yeah. you have like mm -hmm. this red, red and a, and a red, white and a white, white. And you know, the more red meaning the more blood supplies so are just kind of like a little color coordination to explain those ideas. Um, and that red, red being at the menisca capsular junction. So if you're thinking of a C shape, the very outer part of that C is where that good blood supply mm -hmm. is. But on the inside would be closer to the joint itself where you're in the white, white or the A vascular zone. Right. And so keep going with regards to that. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So for, for me, it's um, once again, each one of those stories is a little bit different depending on what group. So we talked about in the young patients when they're in that red, red zone mm -hmm. and it's a tear that isn't kind of a bucket handle pattern. Right. Then if it's just a little crack in that zone, sometimes those might even be a, a blood vessel. Right. You know, so because at the teenage years, and I've seen even people as early, I mean, as late as they're you know, 19 years old or something like that, right. having a little meniscal blood vessel, I don't see that, you know, usually past the age of 20 very often. Right. But in that younger age, they can have a blood vessel that mimics a tear in the red, red zone. And for those, I try to be pretty conservative about. Because um, the healing potential is higher. Right. And it might not even be a tear. It might be just right. a little bruise or something else. And then kind of a... Uh, incorrect, you know, diagnosis on the MRI. Mm -hmm. um, so those I'm pretty, now a bucket handle tear doesn't, generally doesn't look like a, a blood vessel. It's longer, it extends farther mm -hmm. around, um, and a lot of times they're already displaced. Right. And when I know they're displaced, then it's like, okay, that's an unstable injury. That's going to need an operation, right? especially in that young population. Well, and in that young population too, I mean, how often do you see concomitant injuries, you don't always see just an isolated meniscus. A lot of right. times these high energy meniscus tears come in with ACL. Sometimes they have multi-ligament type things where you're, you know, addressing that surgically for something else. And that right. kind of sometimes guides that treatment. Um, with regards to kind of that middle age group, how um, aggressive are you with repairs on those yeah, patients? Um, yeah. And it probably goes back to what we were talking about, about healing potential, but how do you Kind of guide there yeah so um i think that's a population that we both see a right. lot of um and i i usually start with a good course of physical therapy mm -hmm. when they're a degenerative meniscus tear there's been a pretty big you know body of evidence that's pointing us towards uh the idea that physical therapy um and a short-term activity modification can mm -hmm. be very effective right. even in the long run i mean this up is as long as you know five-year results, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, when physical therapy works, it's not just a temporary fix. And that's another question I always get. If it's torn and it's not going to necessarily heal itself back to normal, you know, how am I going to deal with that? Sorry. Um, how am I going to deal with that for that in the long run? And they always think like, okay, my knee is ruined. And, and you know, I think we're pretty give pretty good knowledge to show that five years out that things, that, that, you know, the results on that are pretty good. Um, but not everybody gets mm -hmm. that immediate relief. And I think that's one of the challenges is for somebody who's still having pain right. and they're very disabled and you've done a good two months of, mm -hmm. of rehab and activity modification. At that point, I usually feel like it's time to, to offer a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. And I, I use symptom wise too in those patients. So typically we see them at least six to eight weeks out, maybe more acute, but they usually have kind of had this, they remember an injury, they modified their activities, they kind of um, did some things, maybe not in dedicated therapy, but then they come in, you get the MRI because you have a high suspicion, you see the tear. A lot of times we'll try some conservative treatment, 
one of the things that I think kind of helps dictate and makes it easy for me is whenever I see true mechanical symptoms, true yeah. catching, mm -hmm. true, when I say locking, like a grabbing sensation that keeps them from wanting to bend or pivot or twist mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And when I see that and it's continuing to be a problem despite that, that's usually my trigger for yeah. clinical symptoms to say, okay, now we we'll want to maybe go in and talk about surgery. Some of the patients that I think, you know, they get past that point, they don't have those mechanical symptoms, those are the ones that go on to do well with right. with non-operative conservative treatment. But um, what about whenever you're having that discussion with the, the older patient? They have moderate amount of knee arthritis on yeah. x-ray. They have narrowing, they're not bone on bone, but then they have an acute injury with, mm -hmm. come back with an MRI that shows a meniscus tear. Yeah, I'm usually pretty aggressive with the with the injections at that, at that point. Um, I feel like it's their pain's most likely, you know, a big component of the inflammatory response to the right. tear, right. the debris, all that kind of stuff that, that happens. And I feel like if you can get their inflammation down a little bit to the point where they can handle some good physical therapy, that's usually what I recommend yeah. at that point. And I'm, I'm very, very hesitant to do any sort of meniscus surgery. I usually tell patients at that point is, I don't think that going in there and operating on your knee it has any better chance of making you better than this shot mm -hmm. and therapy. I think they're equal chance, and if you look at the risks, like you want to go under general anesthesia, you want to do, I mean, this, right. the risk for the shot is substantially lower right. than the risk of having to get a whole procedure and get an operation. Because even though it's maybe a what, 20 minute procedure in those cases to do that, it's, it's still, you know, still surgery. Well, and there's medical comorbidities that you see in that patient population that you yeah. don't see in younger patients. Um, you know, the discussion I have to have is that a lot of times you're dealing with an, a significant amount of an arthritic component of pain that they may have not had a limitation with before. So you're educating them also that, hey, you have knee arthritis. Right. They presented for the acute injury. And so there's definitely some education there and having them buy into the fact that, hey, you know what, my knee has some degeneration. It's the first time I've been told that. And that's where I think a lot of that conservative treatment helps with regards right. to those patients. And because the, uh, the pain aspect, where a lot of times I'll have patients tell me, I had no pain before this. Right. How did I have arthritis if I didn't have pain before this now recent pain, no. acute onset? And now I've got this. I, I mean, and it, logically, it's a hard thing to get your mind around right. when you're saying, but I was good before. Now I've got this acute you know, immediate onset of pain, this has to be an injury. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's, it's really a degeneration that's kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. No, exactly. And you, you see those patients too, that you follow them, they have that acute episode, they get this aggravation of arthritis. Um, you know, I've gone in and I've done an arthroscopy for people who've had these degenerative meniscus tears, we've tried conservative treatment, they still have the mechanical symptoms that I was talking yeah. about kind of dictate. And we go in and we clean that meniscus tear up and they come back and they said, you know, I'm doing a little bit better, but they still have pain from the arthritis. Right. And then, you know, you try injections and you try these other things and the arthritis continues to be a problem. So it's right. like you said, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think that's the tricky thing. And that's what studies have shown is that going in and, and treating some of these degenerative, when I say degenerative, in the setting of osteoarthritis, that those patients don't have quite as predictable of an outcome or as, as predictable as some of the younger patients do, for sure. Right. Um, so. Yeah. Um, for me, kind of one of the things I wanted to get your feel on is this, that middle population, because I think that's the trickiest group. The young right. people, I think, were pretty clear on what to do for them, and the population that has some arthritis, mm -hmm. we kind of know, but that middle person who doesn't really have a lot of arthritis, right. what do we do about this meniscus tear? I know that you're, you know, we've talked before about that, uh, the Finnish study where they did the, fake surgery right and they they didn't say with patients with minimal arthritis and that a fake surgery versus the real surgery people did about the same after a year right um, and I mean I think that's the thing is for me it's really trying to determine if there's any gray zone with regards to clinical presentation mm -hmm. on some of those things that I was talking to with regards to the mechanical portion right that I lean pretty heavily upon gotcha um, you know, if somebody has a lot of acute inflammation and some of these symptoms that we think may be more mechanical and they're not, you know, I'm thinking of the 40 year old, I would talk about a steroid injection, try to get the inflammation right. down, get everything calmed down, get to a baseline and try some of the conservative approach. 
before diving in. Yeah. Um, a lot of times it's difficult because that's a working population. That right. It's time off, it's limitation, mm -hmm. it's inability to be active, and so it's tricky. Yeah, and uh, I'm kind of the same way, you know, pretty aggressive with that steroid injection, and it's it's still always like a little bit of a, a balance. And I'm, I had been very much on the mechanical kind of symptoms, mm -hmm. push me one way or another, but when I have patients who have pain yeah. and their joint space still looks great, and we've already failed all the all the tricks in my bag that aren't surgery. Right. I, at that point, I really don't have much to offer, and and um, that is just kind of to me just a gut call, kind of yeah. you know what's what kind of lifestyle does the patient want? How disabling is this for them? And um, how kind of that that gray area about like well how how are they going to manage the extra stress that is a surgery right because uh, and if, if they think that the surgery is going to be make their stress less then then we kind of have to readjust what the expectations are right. but if they are somebody who understands that i'm going to have to modify make big modifications after surgery mm -hmm. um then it's something that if, if, if we can you know we can partner up on and, and go down that road i'm happy to go down them with them but it's just to making sure that they understand like hey this is a yeah, I think it's exactly it's no, right. As right. you go through that process with them, there's that education component. Yeah. And so it kind of gets into a good kind of segue, and we can kind of wrap up with, with regards to, say you do go in and do surgery. Yeah. So in the younger patient for you, where you go and you do have to do a repair, right? Um, and you're going to do a repair of a meniscus, and let's say it's a meniscus that you're not having to do a big major bucket handle repair, what's kind of the typical rehab for standard meniscus repair in a younger athlete? And yeah. then we can kind of go up, you know, from there to meniscectomy. Right. So for the standard repair, there is a portion of it that's where we don't weight bear the patient. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm uh, on the spectrum of how fast to weight bear amongst in the sports medicine kind of community. I'm pretty aggressive about weight bearing earlier than a lot of others. Right. There's no right answer. You know, there's con conflicting science on it, on whether or not you're, you're, you're potentially decreasing the healing rate by weight bearing early or weight bearing too late. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a kind of conflicting evidence there. Yeah. I'm probably a little bit lean towards weight bearing earlier, but even that, everybody goes on crutches. So is that four protected. weeks, six weeks for you? Depends on how bad the tear is. Okay. So on some of the tears that are a little bit more, like, like just smaller and a little bit more stable mm -hmm. to where maybe they were a stable pattern, but we, didn't, we rehabbed it and it didn't get much better okay. and it's not unstable until I really even when I pull on it, it's not very unstable, but there's pain yeah. and it's not a, it's deep in the meniscus that I can't kind of buff it out or right. do a partial. Then in those cases, I'm usually going to start weight bearing somewhere around that three weeks, at, at least okay. a protected weight bearing mm -hmm. um, and with full weight bearing happening at six weeks. Okay. Um, for the very unstable patterns, ones that have been displaced chronically, yeah, you're that are, out. right. Those ones were very, very slow with mm -hmm. or root repairs, which are a, a whole different discussion. Oh, yeah. But uh, those those more complex meniscus, more unstable tears, those Require ones more I, protection. I would protect longer, and that's up to six weeks. So, and I kind of follow your protocol with regards to, and depending upon where it is, I'll, I'll limit how much bending yeah. I allow them to do when they start weight bearing, uh, just because of that stress. So sometimes I'll have them locked in extension and let them begin to kind of weight bear, and then progressively yeah. let them move more. Um, with the meniscectomies where you're going in and you're resecting a portion of the meniscus for these tears that are avascular in that white, white uh, zone, those patients, I feel like you kind of have to be careful because those are the patients that they immediately feel like they're up and they're right. moving and you have to warn them that you can, you can weight bear immediately, you just have to be careful you don't overdo it because your knee can swell, but you have to be careful because those patients are super happy, they're excited, right. it's an in and out thing for them, but they'll tell other patients that have a different type of tear oh, I had my knee scoped and they cleaned up my meniscus. And so you kind of have to be careful because everybody's different. Right, that, I'm with you. Those tears that are, um, I used to tell patients that I, I can get away with just buffing, mm -hmm. right? It's like a kind of think about it like a paint scratch. Yeah. You know, a deep scratch into your paint is going to need paint job, you know, but a little one, probably buff it out. So yeah. um, if it's one of those ones where it's purely mechanical symptoms, it's very easy to put it right where their their tear is 
and that there's no arthritis in the knee and I can just shave it out, you're right. They are, I had a guy go and do 100 miles on his bike like four days after surgery <laughs> one time. And, um, but it's, it's unfortunate that when you have somebody who even has mechanical symptoms but has some full mm -hmm. thickness holes in their cartilage, they don't come back that, that quickly. Right. And I usually, when, they're, when we are in that arthritis meniscus category and we failed mm -hmm. and we're gonna do a we're going to do an arthroscopy and, and address it surgically. I'm very, very keen to look at how much edema we have in the bone. Mm -hmm. And if we do, then I'm, they're, they're non weight bearing. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we covered it pretty well. Yeah. So we'll well, have thanks. to, uh, yeah. Good session. Yeah. Until next time. Yep. Yeah. Signing off. Thanks.